Hello, everybody. I'm very excited. Just listening to our speakers so far, I'm just like, oh, I'm a little bit in awe. I had to kind of collect my thoughts at the break because Ryan gosling through me. Um, he had me at a very early age, and that was not a good start for me, so I've really been trying to focus on what I'm going to open with. Um, but really, before I kind of head into the icebreaker at a glance, I just want to kind of be really clear. I'm not here to tell the story of Icebreaker, because that would be pretty ridiculous, because the founders just sat there, and he'll tell it better. But I am going to tell a story about how, at Icebreaker, we took the decision through really observing our progress over time, through stepping back, through taking some bold steps to maybe um, ask ourselves some hard questions, to get to a point where we took the decision to really take a different path and to reinvent our, our destiny. Um, we're 23 years old, so celebrating a quarter of a century in 2020 that we're looking forward to, and we're currently sold in 47 countries. Our product mix, what's really important, we've heard it a lot today about simplicity, but the core of our product mix and our growth comes from the very things that we did at the beginning. It comes from our next-to-skin core, our base layer, our accessories, our socks, and our underwear, the things we started out with, and that's still a strong part of our business. Our customers, you know, we have broad customer base, but one of the things that had always, always drawn me to Icebreaker in my past before I was here was that Icebreaker, heavily distributed in a great way in the outdoor industry, it was unheard of that brands in the outdoor industry had almost a 50-50 split of men and women. And that's really, really impressive. And it might sound obvious, but actually that was Jeremy's doing from the outset, to, to create something that had equality built in from day one versus who are we trying to close. That will come into play a little bit later when I talk about kind of some of the early findings that we discovered. We didn't only um, work with the miracle fiber that is merino wool, but we actually, in doing so, created an entire category. So 23 years ago, we set about doing something that was never done, pioneered through that whole, what you've heard today already, which to me is just such, gives you such contagious um, feelings when you think about how founders kind of follow through with this belief and courage that there is nothing going to stand in their way. And even though it was, you know, in Jeremy's words, a ridiculous thought that merino wool could actually be a contender in a synthetic and petrochemical driven industry, he was completely unfazed that that was actually going to stop him. And that's something that I've come to call and, and name um, and love about being in New Zealand is naive intelligence. It's this Kiwi trait, I feel, and particularly what Jeremy displayed, which is this naivety, but great intelligence and human intelligence to know that it's more than the products you make, it's how you make them. And there was something there festering for Jeremy that was certainly more than garments. Sustainably sourced sounds on trend. Um, it sounds very current. But I want to be really, really clear. From the outset, the making of products, of clothing, was not really the, the motivator. It wasn't really the single thing that Jeremy really wants to focus on or the business wants to focus on. It was about how. How do we actually do it differently, do it better? What are the component parts of doing that? Who are we going to work with? How are we going to create product in a way that's never been done before? And how are we going to create a legacy so that our business can potentially drive change for other companies coming into the category? We've got 350-ish employees now. It was still pretty small for our footprint. But, you know, I think that in a, in a snapshot, it gives you a feel that 23 years, we've achieved a lot. Nature always has a better solution. We haven't talked much about the brand purpose. It was the simple idea that nature has a better solution. That's what we believe at Icebreaker. That is still true. Now, underneath all of that was actually the bigger philosophy around how do you actually create a sustainable and transparent business, 
not just be a fantastic product maker of sustainable product. And that's really the, the kind of the hot spot. That's the real truth that through our own investigations, we came full circle and we realized, and this is kind of the good part of the story, we realized that we hadn't actually done an awful lot terribly wrong. We hadn't actually tried to reinvent ourselves, but what we had done and what we had to face up to is we kind of stopped talking to the customer and we weren't as close to them maybe as we were in the early phases and we didn't really know too much about what they wanted. We thought we knew what they wanted and that gap between their expectation and what we were doing was pretty big. And that was really kind of the start of how do we get back to our own brilliance? How do we really start to reset our own destiny? So we decided to take a hold, be intentional, design to some different outcomes and do it differently. And we did that through some really simple steps. Um, firstly, we set a central que question and I'll talk to you about that in a second. Sounds obvious. It's not. Um, some, you know, a central question isn't how can you get to a billion? That's how do you drive sales? The question is central to the outcome. So setting a central question is really, really critical to determining what it is you then set about your organization to do about driving change. We went through a period of obvious, sounds obvious, a lot of this is very obvious, seeking out new perspectives. If we were going to look in the same place, we'd always looked to find the answers to some of these new era conundrums we were facing. Why on earth did we think we'd find something new? If we went exactly to the same place where we'd always been going, within our own industry, within our own kind of network of brands that we might have adjacencies with, what, would, what did we think we'd find out? We actually didn't need to find anything out about apparel. That was it's not interesting. We needed to understand the lifestyle of the consumer. We needed to understand what the shift was in how everything was joining together, way more than what products do they like to buy and, and where do they like to hang out. Well, that's very important, but it wasn't our driving focus. The third point is reinvention for us, it'll be different for all businesses, was certainly not about changing everything that we were about and becoming an entirely different company. If you can't build from the very core essence of what you set out to achieve, then you've got to ask some of the central questions because you're figuring some stuff out that I can't answer. But when you've got some good stuff there that external people, consumers, customers, partners, people that have worked with you a long time, people that don't know you, start to all line up that are truths. You know that you've got the good stuff in your hands. You know you don't need to be overly creative because it's still relevant. And the fourth thing that was at the outset, you know, how exciting is it to create things? It's just, it's so exciting. And why is executing not sometimes as exciting? And that's actually the conundrum, that a strategy in its entirety has to have the ability to be executed. You don't have a strategy and then think about executing it. A strategy is end to end. And if it's a good strategy and if it's gonna step change your business, you will have thought about some of the things that you're going to have to do to organize your teams, your processes, the practical stuff, the operations, to achieve what it is you're identifying as this new opportunity. Otherwise, you will probably get the same outcome um, and frustrate a whole lot of people. So setting that central question, I want to share with you what we set. And I just want to talk really quickly about why. So what needs to be true to move our business from a product-driven organization to a consumer-led model? Icebreaker makes natural performance clothing. That's a fact. So we know how to make clothing, and we've been in business for 23 years, and even though we've got some hiccups, we kind of know how to sell it. So trying to know how to make better clothing and sell more or less, is that gonna get a different outcome? And we really wanted to force change. We really wanted to give ourselves an uncomfortable itch where we just knew we had to go into the hard stuff. Our, our business was built on product. 
We make product. So to ask our business to do the entire opposite and turn it all the way around and start with insight meant it wasn't just about moving people around, it was about changing behaviors, it was about changing expectations, and it was certainly not about product lineup. It came last, Jeremy talked about that earlier. The second thing I talked about was seeking out new perspectives, exploring the unknown. It's my most comfortable place to be in the middle of ambiguity, not knowing where anything's going, because that's when you'll find something nobody else has. If you follow a really clear methodology of how to harvest insights from a sector, you'll likely get a lot of what's already out there with a different complexion. But if you take that courage you've heard about this morning, and I'm, I'm in a very fortunate position, a very privileged position, I'm working with an organization and with a founder and a company that has got a lot of history doing this, but they needed help to become more relevant, to stay relevant and to do it better. So we had to ask some different questions. We had to start looking in different places. And also we faced a whole bunch of challenges. You know, natural, it's a dirty word. It's on every product in the supermarket, yet it's full of additives. Natural performance, nature. There's brands and businesses everywhere actually not following through on what it means. So when you go through the whole process of what are we looking at working with, the actual world out there has been turned on its head. It's been incredibly difficult for us to try and find that value and stay relevant. So here we started looking at some bigger shifts that were happening over time and how over the past 10 or 15 years, trends in organic foods have become more pre prevalent, how people care more about what they wash their hair with and what they put on their skin. Ten years ago, everybody bought Pantene or Herbal Essence, and now everyone's talking about a brand name that I can't even pronounce, but it's really good because it's made from everything that's natural. These things are not just trends. They're changing the way the consumer consumes. And trends in apparel, you've got to think, right? You've got to think that if those two first buckets have happened, and even though we've been here for 23 years and there's many brands that have been here longer, uh, you've got to think that soon the consumer and the customer is going to want to ask more about what they're putting next to their skin. What are you actually wearing? What is actually happening when you put petrochemicals next to your body? Do we know? Are there, is there any proof yet? No, but there's a thought that there's got to be a better way than putting plastic next to your skin. And that's something that really kind of spurred us on in our own journey to understanding more. Evolving customer expectations, not only has everything changed, not only how you reach the consumer ha has changed, but also what they value has changed. You know, we've talked a lot today about transparency and sustainability. Transparency is something that's right at the crux of who we are at Icebreaker. And in the vein of listening to our consumers, we learned quick when we first started this piece of work. In fact, we did exactly what you've heard today. We were only f five months into our piece of work when we said they want to know more about where we make our clothing and how. We'd taken it for granted that because we knew, they knew. And we've just recently launched our first transparency report, which actually we're all incredibly proud of because it's an industry first that shows end-to-end -end visibility of every single partner we work with in our supply chain. It's a first. And that's really the purpose, right? Driving change and showing sectors and organizations that it just takes one to kind of start that movement. We've got a bit of work to do. We've got a big product line. It's got to be our goal to reduce and simplify. But that's actually part of what we're working on. And, and I want to say thank you to the speakers so far because it's the new business leaders in the world that are helping older, more mature companies imagine and reinvent where they want to go next. And with, without being you know, too afraid, we do have a big part of our distribution in wholesale. It's where we're from. And we've got a really profitable, growing, exciting D2C business. But we can't just pull the plug tomorrow on wholesale. It's our business. 
So we have to have a really clear program of how we now start to make choices so that we don't actually under-deliver for all of the partners that have been with us throughout our 23 years, but so we start to actually pull back to that core of who we are and getting closer to what we set out to achieve with less. Through our insight, we harvested some really great um, nuts and bolts around actually understanding our consumer and how we wanted to really reimagine the opportunity with the consumer. I should say that somebody else has said it this morning, but we didn't hire anybody to do this work. We actually did it internally. And you know, one of the first things we did was make the decision to actually keep me out of the business and keep me completely external from the day-to-day -day operating side of the business. Because it's really hard to stay objective when you're trying to unpick where you may have kind of lost your true north. So I actually joined Icebreaker two years ago in January. I didn't relocate to New Zealand until the July. And we spent an intense period where I almost wasn't an icebreaker. I was really the consumer, just figuring out what's going on out there. How are we consuming? What are the big changes? And this enabled a whole lot of synthesizing of the real big truths, the real big opportunities for us to distill who we call the core adventurer, our core consumer today, that is actually so much more evolved than, than when we had them 20 years ago, that even if we only focused on those guys for the next 20 years, we'd still have a lot of work to do. But when you're reinventing your pathway, you certainly want to be able to have the midterm and you want to have the long term, because you don't want to get into that phase one, two, three again. You want to actually prevent the lull. You want to drive sustainable growth. So we identified an emerging consumer group for us that really started to help us separate our core business and our day-to-day -to, -day to perhaps another trajectory around how do we get closer to D2C? How do we actually drive a different end state for a different consumer with different needs? But really understanding that both these consumers want to align their values with brands that are transparent, that are ethical, and that come from more than just the product they make. So three, building from truths. Logic will take you from A to B, and imagination will take you everywhere. I'm a bit of an Einstein geek, even though I clearly don't have a clue what he's talking about. He's just got some great quotes. And I love this guy because, yes, you need, you need logic, you need process, but without belief, and without imagination, how are you going to get to your end state? Are you going to map it there with building blocks of numbers and then build some stuff to hit the numbers? Or are you going to get there through imagining who you want to be and what you want to stand for and what change you want to be part of? And that's, that is the good stuff. Now, like I said, I was very privileged. I came to a business that had the good stuff. And I remember my first presentation to the board and Jeremy was, I actually don't know what the problem is here. You've got everything you need. It's in your hands. And the problem was we'd just forgotten how to tell the story. We'd actually forgotten our strength of character. We had got confused with what was important because we'd been looking at the competition. I used to be a, a track runner, and my coach used to say, when you're running the 100 meters, look straight ahead. Don't look, look left or right. You'll lose a split second. And the temptation to look to see if they're just running faster than you, it it's turns your stomach because you want to see if they're going faster. That's the competition. If you can stay your course and you look to what you're creating, and from time to time, when maybe it's not a race, look around, that's great, but don't lose sight of who you are. So we built a framework that we believe is entirely scalable. We now have real clarity on what provenance means to us, what people means to us, and what product means to us. And provenance is more than New Zealand. I, I'm Clearly, you've guessed, I'm not from New Zealand. But one of the first observations I made when I got here was, why is everything back home always about Mount Cook? Why is, you know, I've been here lots, but man, why don't we talk about the brilliant creativity that is here? 
And that was something that I fell in love with very, very quickly. Whether it was Edmund Hillary getting up there first, whether it's the founder of DNA, whether it's Jeremy Moon or a bunch of other brilliant business leaders from New Zealand, isn't it phenomenal what the characteristics of what is coming out of New Zealand is? And that actually is this tenacity and strength to actually just give the impossibles are not impossible, right? Nothing's holding us back. We're holding us back. And because I truly believe of where we're located, we have it all in our hands. We don't have anyone to answer to. It's up to us to go out and make the, make the call. And provenance is really that heritage, inspiration, and character, that grit of naive intelligence. People are our partners, our suppliers, our teams, our consumers. But for us, we have long-lasting, from day one, relationships with the growers, our growers, that actually supply our entire merino wool. Uh, we've entered into 10-year contracts with them. We don't just make product. We are in the business of having relationships with human beings. That's actually what we do. Product is, as Jeremy said, a manifestation of all of that. It's nothing more than how you kind of put, put something out there at the end. How you go about doing that is really, really where you know if you're on the right track. You know in your gut if you're doing the good stuff. And product, it's important. It, it's what our business is built on, but it's actually the execution, as I said. And really what's more important is our beliefs around nature has the solutions versus are we trying to keep up with every other apparel company out there on the block. I'll just briefly say that as a result, we actually moved into redefining and really kind of understanding that the consumer doesn't live the way the industry have been telling us they live. They weren't doing an exercise or an activity, taking their clothes off and doing it another way. They were actually living this new ecosystem of everything's possible, wearable, interchangeable. And once we'd understood that they didn't potentially need a cycling outfit, a hiking outfit, a skiing outfit, everything that we were making could start to be looked at with very different eyes. Our consumer uh, product architecture is now built with our next to skin business at the core. You saw that's still 65% of who we are at the core. That's our truth. And then we surround the consumer with the things that we know they're spending their time doing and we build what they need for them when they need it, making sure that it's entirely useful, it's entirely purposeful, and that it's, it's, it's not wasteful, that there's a reason why they may be choosing Icebreaker than, than somebody else. As part of that building on truths, we had to face up to, you know, we've probably been doing a bit of a one-size-fits-all. Distributed in 47 countries, that's quite a lot lots of different types of dynamics, lots of different consumers. We, we, rep, we are represented in wholesale, in e-commerce, and in retail. But actually, each one of those executions is different. So we set about really defining strategies by channel that were actually coming from the same brand. And that's where we'd fallen over a little bit in the past. We were servicing the growth by, for all of our markets. But when we came back to ourselves, we had a more dislocated version of ourselves because of how we were distributing. Most importantly, and I don't have a chart to this, I'm just going to talk it through, organizing to execute. It's the fourth step in the kind of the methodology that we've just you know, rapidly put in place, we've adopted, we've learned as we've gone. For me, I've learned that you know, roughly right is the best kind of mantra you could ever get because perfection ain't happening. So take it, live it, build it as it's moving, get closer to the customer, take the feedback with all the goodwill in the world because it's really okay to fail. And it's really OK to learn from that and then do it quicker. We've reorganized our business quite rapidly. And um, 
and quite broad. We've changed how our marketing teams operate. In fact, we don't have a traditional marketing model anymore. We've really started to reinforce our, our digital model much more um, and really invested in a whole new set of capability around content, around having a publishing mindset in the kind of the early days of storytelling because we know there's more to do there than press releases. We've also redesigned our entire product team to operate and think differently, to start with insight about what the consumer wants and don't feel pressured to actually create something for a seasonal business when we've already got more than we need. Product is not the solution. You've got to really understand what is that unmet need. So this, for me, is one of the, the biggest areas that if a business has a great idea of how it wants to re-navigate, re redirect itself, reorchestrate its end state, be really prepared to organize, to execute, because otherwise you will get the same outcome and you will, at best, only get incremental growth and you might not even get that if you don't start to organize closer towards what the consumer expectation is. Jeremy shared this earlier. I just want to share it again, but it's actually from a brand perspective. So our purpose is nature has the solutions. Our consumers, we've identified we have two. From a brand perspective, we can see that uh, we explore the relationships between people and with how they consume, and also with how they explore their relationships with nature. From a product perspective, everything we do, what needs to be true in our product hierarchy and DNA is natural performance. It's more than Merino, but it's natural performance. And then our execution, we have a strong operational side of the business that allows us to maintain and stay on track of our overall goal. So just in summary, recognize the signs and take action. The signs will be different for every business. This is me just sharing some of what we recognized. But actually, the central question is only important if we actually understand that you've got to be fit for your purpose. Seek out new perspectives, stay open-minded, look in the places you never looked before. Don't go where you've always gone. What do you think you're going to find? You know it anyway. It's inherent. You've got it. Build from the truths. Remind at the very outset of why this business exists and then track, does it still exist for the same reason and are you still achieving what you want to achieve or do you want to re-enhance that? And organize to execute. Really be open to preparing yourselves for the required change because if you didn't need to change, you, would, you wouldn't need to redirect your business. You'd be on track. The point is, when you find the courage to really look into some of the what's right in front of you, you have to follow through and find the courage to, to go the whole hog because isn't it our responsibility as business leaders to actually drive change and do it as best we can? Thank you. Even though you've got an English accent, you're a great Kiwi. This is weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, it's pretty weird. Hi. Um, okay, so... <laughs> <laughs> I've gone red. Okay. You know, like, colour, colour is by far the best marketer I've, I've ever met, not just worked with. And uh, as a consequence, we gave you the head of strategy role as well, right? Yeah. Because um, you demonstrated to us so clearly that how we won was all in the choices yeah. and the interaction between those objects, who our customer is, how our brand relates to our purpose, how our product is an expression of brand. But you also work very closely in direct the product team. So can you share your experience of what it was like when you were asking the product design team, who are based in Portland, Oregon, uh, to think differently. Um, do they go, you know, I want to do my own thing, or do they go, yay, what type of, what, what, what was the emotional reaction um, from the product team? So the emotional reaction was always great. Who doesn't want to change and think differently? The how is always the huh because when a business has operated a certain way for so long, when change isn't mapped out, it's the old adage of just saying something 
and not actually doing it. So we went through a, a period where the team were probably apprehensive because they didn't really understand their part in the change. And within six to nine months, we actually worked very closely to just, just slowly twist how they actually started the product creation process. So they would start with looking back a season to see what we'd made and what worked. And they'd listen to our markets and the sales guys about what was selling and that's all great. And then at some point, probably way too late, we'd then say, what consumer insights have we got? So actually I put a rule in place where they couldn't actually kick off any new work until they'd really got that essence of what is it we're trying to do for the consumer that we haven't already done. And when they started to think that way, they became really immersed in, whilst it's hard to change, they could see clearly that that was a good direction. And there's a framework there where there's you know, three kind of segments of, of product. For us, we call it adventure training and life. Um, did you have to bring in any new talent to execute those, or do you have the same designers working across all of them? So, like I said, if you want a different outcome, you have to do things differently. So we were pretty good at understanding our core business, our next-to-skin business, our adventure business. But we knew that the newer consumer, the urban adventurer, was certainly looking for a different aesthetic and was certainly looking for our product to represent something far more simple than perhaps the outdoor can offer. So we did hire um, two new designers that, and actually design teams that now actually work on those segments of the business quite differently from adventure, so that we're really true to the execution of the brief. And you mentioned with the marketing team, um, you changed from kind of a, a graphic design mindset to a publishing mindset. So why and how did you rethink uh, the reorganization around the marketing and brand team? I, th I think the, the, the biggie is, and I think Shane kind of kicked it off this morning, everything that we're learning from new businesses, no matter what, whether they're in services or products, is it's starting with conversations. And it's starting with always on conversations, learning, listening, being present. Now, you can't do that if you only do it once a quarter to check in with how they're feeling. So the whole restructure was about having a digital hub that was always on, that are authors, creators, and it was wonderful to hear you know, Shane expressing that you can't outsource the purpose. You can't give that away, but you can certainly work with some of the best in class partners to enable you to, to, to execute who you are better. And it was an interesting observation before the, the kind of the, there was a vibe about the purpose and the brand, but we'd never given it the clarity. And there was some tough calls about product. Was there some stuff that you had to kill or change? Did it approach actually the difference in design, um, you know, at the root core level when we said we're only about natural performance? So that's, that, I think, will be always present. That's, when you talk, when I hear, uh, and you, Jeremy, and others talk about the, the key principles, I think the point is you're never done. But where we were in our phase was about actually getting back to brilliance, getting back to who we wanted to be. So that meant taking out not only product, but actually potentially if the product was a great garment that everybody wanted, but we'd made it in a certain way that wasn't now fitting our DNA, we had to reconstitute it with something that was natural, with something that we could manage the margin on, with something that would still give the consumer the same effect. So we've made some and we're still in that building of that program, but we've certainly set the gauntlet down that there is a very clear framework of who we are in product. I think just now, listening to Nick about colour, I've got some colleagues here, they will be, you know, I feel very strongly about colour, being an innovator, um, and I actually believe that there's a whole bunch of work that we've got to do in the next six months that will really set us into the, the next trajectory around the volume of what we make, how we make it, and borrowing some of that good stuff from Nikon simplification. 
So I think, you know, the moral of that story was applying this kind of startup thinking, you know, going back to who the customer really is, yep. how they've changed, and as a consequence, the ripple down effect through the business. And there was a slide that you put up um, earlier which had about those meta trends around organic food, people being conscious about what they're eating, how they're living, what they're putting on their skin with skincare. And we could just so clearly see, you illustrated to us so clearly, that actually this whole kind of wave is just, is just beginning yeah. to turn. And that ironically was when, like from a personal point of view, a lot of this, because I was in a support role here, it's very important that the founder doesn't run this type of process. You might because that. you bring your old kind of biases and things like that. So, yep. But also, you know, I was reflecting on, you know, going back to when Icebreaker started, we wanted to offer a natural alternative to synthetics, but we wanted to disrupt the outdoor industry. So it felt like when we started reconnecting with the consumer trends, it's like these millennial values it's of transparency, bad. authentic brands wanting to live a more sustainable life are becoming more relevant. Um, and actually, true to kind of the founding vision, this is where VF Corporation uh, came into being. So we came into contact with the biggest, most powerful company in the outdoor industry, VF own a whole bunch of amazing brands. They're a $15 billion company. There's no bigger impact. So the calculation was kind of, if we're really committed to having a global impact and being a disruptive force in the outdoor industry, there's no better uh, you know, company to partner with. And this is the, the phase that Icebreaker is, is entering now. So I just want to personally thank you for that amazing journey that mm. you've taken the whole company on and also for sharing it all, all with us uh, today. Oh, thank Thanks. You.